you, Tom, for that lovely introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to thank David for the honor and privilege of attending the 30th annual UK NEQAS conference. I had the privilege of attending UK NEQAS approximately 20 years ago, where I presented four studies where, that I chaired on the adoption of single platform CD4 counting. So the little discussion that we just had on CD4 was very apropos and brought back a lot of memories. Uh, secondly, I want to thank um, Frank for kind of bringing us to the future. My lecture will not be so progressive in technology. Seven years ago when I was recruited to the University of Southern California, my job really was to take him from the past in the 80s, at least up to the present. And so when I got there, we were not doing single platform. We were not doing multicolor flow cytometry. My HLA laboratory was still doing cell-based cytotoxicity assays. So I have 15 laboratories and about 20 cost centers that were all really living in the past. And so I also want to thank Brent and Michael. So what I'm going to present today is the perspective from a laboratory who was subject to decentralization of COG testing. As you saw, Michael presented very convincingly the power of MRG testing in BALL in predicting outcomes following treatment. That necessitated the essentially decentralization and loss of funding to those two centralized laboratories. And laboratories like myself had to adopt the protocols that they had to develop. So I'm going to present our experience with that test. Secondly, I want to thank Brent who presented very elegantly what you run into when you establish a very good test, validate the test, and then run into really progressive science where we're now treating diseases with the very markers we're using to identify them in our laboratories. So I'm gonna tell you basically from a perspective of you not knowing anything about all the acronyms you've heard over the past two days. So a little bit, a tiny little bit about COG from my perspective. Um, pediatric B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia and the major advances in outcomes that have been witnessed over the past 50 years. A little bit about risk adapted therapy and what that means to me as a user and not a leader coming from COG. Um, and then of course, minimal residual disease detection. How do you do that? What does it mean? And then how it's really been established with extremely rock solid data as an extremely good prognostic factor following treatment. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, my experience with the decentralization and my role um, in establishing a COG approved laboratory to measure MRG. Um, and then once we had done that and in the process of doing that, what it meant getting now samples from patients that were really being treated with biologics that, that made using the CD19-based COG MRD assay very challenging. So the Children's Oncology Group is really a, 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 it's a, it's a many groups that have been formed um, uh, as cooperative group systems. So in 2000, as Michael mentioned yesterday, is four of the main uh, pediatric cancer groups consolidated into one um, Children's Oncology Group, and that was the Children's Cancer Study Group the Pediatric Oncology Group, which our center was a major component of, Intergroup uh, Rhabdomyosarcoma Study Group, and then the National Wilms Tumor Study Group, they all merged to become COG uh, in 19, sorry, um, in 2000. So this group is studied, uh, the, the, the COG is supported by the National Institute of Health, which is a federal organization in the United States, conducts a spectrum of clinical and translational research on infants, children, young uh, adolescents, and young adults. There are now more than 200 centers in the US, Canada, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Australia, and New Zealand. And greater than 90% of children in the United States that are diagnosed with cancer are seen in one of the COG centers uh, uh, worldwide. This is just to illustrate the major progress that has been achieved in the 10-year survival rate of children with pediatric BALL. In the 1950s, when these study groups were beginning, the diagnosis of BALL was a death knell. As you can see now, over 90% of the patients have greater than a 10-year survival outcome. Why? Primarily for three reasons. Um, obviously, the improvement of 
chemotherapeutic regimens and biologics, um, improved supportive and prophylactic care, and finally, really the model is risk adaptive therapy. And the risks, again, are threefold. Clinical features that are present at diagnosis, and we talk about this all the time, the biology of the disease. Two simple things that we think of all the time are the white blood cell count and the age at presentation. Obviously, the biologic and genetic features of the blast themselves, and this has become a real practical science nowadays as we are sequencing all of our new and relapsed leukemias. And lastly, the response to treatment. And so as we have heard over the past day, the response to treatment, primarily now measured as minimum residual disease at various stages of treatment, really help us to determine the therapy regimen that our patients are going to satisfy and proceed on. Um, minimal residual disease, there are various definitions. I like this one because it's very generic. Again, presence of disease in cases deemed to be in complete remission by con uh, conventional pathologic analysis. It really doesn't tell you how you measure or what it is. It basically says that there's disease that you can measure well beyond what we have been measuring traditionally in the pathology sense. Um, we heard very, very elegantly from Michael yesterday how well established MRD is in BLL as a predictor of outcome. Um, and there are two, really two seminal studies that were published, one in the United States and one in Europe. Um, and I think the quote from Michael in his blood paper in 2015 really states it well. Uh, numerous studies have established that MRD is the most powerful prognostic factor for predicting outcome in children, adolescents, and young adults with ALL. Um, this just was published last year, and it's a meta-analysis of all studies that have been published, looking at outcomes following the measurement of MRD, and I think this shows extremely clearly the power of MRD testing in various phases of treatment with event-free survival in patients with no MRD, clearly separated from patients with MRD, overall survival in patients um, with no MRD versus overall survival in patients with MRD, clearly a test that is no longer and can no longer be deemed research. So how is MRD measured? And again, I don't have to go over this very much. We've heard a lot about this over the past few days, but just kind of to summarize, molecular methods, which are more common in Europe than the United States, they're a little more expensive, they're a little less widely available, but they are amenable to extremely good standardization. Um, PCR may be fast, but NGS is a little slower, so if you want a faster turnaround time, NGS is probably not your answer today, although that may be coming. On the contrary, flow cytometry is very much more common in the United States. Um, it's moderately expensive, expensive. It has wide availability. It's relatively quick, but it suffers from poor standardization, as we have heard. So what are the advantages again? Um, intermediate to high sensitivity, four color 0.1 to 0.01 percent, six color a little better, and as was published last year by the uh, Euroflow group, if you acquire five million events with eight color, you could get down to 0.0001 percent. Um, it's moderately expensive again, widely available, relatively rapid turnaround time, and generally applicable to pretty much all um, leukemias, again, maybe depending on the original pattern that you are trying to identify post-treatment. Um, disadvantages, again, poor standardization amongst laboratories. We saw this diagram yesterday. Um, again, this is eight laboratories, um, theoretically and self-reported to have been performing MRD testing, and you can see that the concordance in those laboratories on the first pass was pretty poor, 26%. However, we know that with training and remediation, this can be improved, and I think this was the second or third round, or send out number five. Uh, the discordant rate now is only 9%. So with training and remediation and relatively standardized protocols, we think we can get to better standardization of flow cytometry for the measurement of MRD. And this leads us to essentially the um, the uh, National Institute of Health decision to decentralize MRD testing, the outcome data, and the ability to get similar results in laboratories using a standardized protocol led to the decentralization, um, essentially the, the elimination of funding to do this in a clinical trial sense and to fund the two um, national laboratories to essentially provide training programs for laboratories like mine that now have to adopt this technology or in fact pay for the service. So our hospital decided to go for the, um, the 
approval uh, from the COG Center for uh, six color MRD testing in DALL. Um, and I think most of this we've heard about already, the two laboratories performing uh, COG testing nationally in the United States for Michael Borowitz and Brent Wood. In 2014, a um, decision was made to decentralize this testing and have testing performed locally in the different laboratories. Um, I think that everything here we've already touched on. Basically, um, the NCI initiated a COG approval program. In the next slide, I'll show you the um, directive that was given to us um, and ha exactly how to do this. And I've highlighted what I think were the important parts. Basically, to attain approval, laboratories must submit at least 60 end of induction cases tested simultaneously both in our own laboratory and again at one of the central COG laboratories. And we must have at least 15 MRD positive specimens. And this may sound easy, but if you saw the 10 year survival and outcome and results of MRD, we don't get a whole lot of MRD positive patients anymore. So you'll see what that portends for our approval and the time that it took to achieve that. So it is necessary that local laboratories that wish to become approved to perform MRD testing for BALL patients enrolled in COG ALL trials follow the exact COG flow cytometry reference laboratory procedure, and then we were able to download copies of the protocol, or if you happen to know Brent or Mike, they slid you a nice copy of the protocol and helped you and explained to us some of the details on how to get through the protocol. This is the panel, which we saw yesterday. Again, there are two tubes, um, really, that allow you to quantitate the percentage of abnormal cells, and you use, use tube three to get your denominator of nucleated mononuclear cells. There was a uh, pre-qualification component, which is really the training and remediation part of the assay. So we completed our first five specimens, submitted them to COG, and had uh, suggestions for improvement on the procedure. We reanalyzed, resubmitted, and we'll show you the time, um, the timeline in terms of how that progressed. And so at the, at the end of the day, the results that we submitted to COG had to agree with the COG central uh, reference laboratories within a half of a log. So this is the timeline, and I doubt that you can read this, especially uh, my wife in the back row. I'm sure you can't see this. Um, but basically, we began in um, July of 2014 when Brent handed me a copy of the procedures. We took the procedures back to the laboratory. Um, we ordered the reagents, and we started to develop our protocols. Um, we um, had to submit a letter of intent to become an approved laboratory, and that was the 21st of November. Uh, this was acknowledged the next day that we were approved to proceed with validation of the COG assay. So internally, now by March, we've completed our SOPs, and we have to develop not only a validation plan to be in agreement with the COG reference laboratory, I now have to develop an internal validation plan because I'm changing my COG MRD assay from the assay that I had essentially validated with all of the CAP CLIA guidelines. I now have to validate the COG not only against the reference laboratory, but I validate against my in-house MRD assay. Um, so we completed the training by June, submitted the first five cases in November. Very quickly, COG got back to us with recommendations, feedback, and we resubmitted our analyses in December. By February, we were cleared to proceed to collect the, the remaining 60 cases with an additional 13 positive MRD cases. So you can see a year later, I had my 60 cases with 15 positive, submitted that in March. And by um, uh, March 21st, only two weeks later, we were approved as the only California laboratory performing COG MRD testing. So um, the strategy, and again, I think Michael presented this very well, so we don't have to dwell on this very much, but it basically uses the difference from normal approach to identify abnormal cells in your MRD positive black. Um, uses CD19 as the primary targeting antigen for gating, and it uses hierarchical gating with increasing purity uh, essentially as a seed to identify pure MRD positive populations. Just a few uh, dot plots. Um, I don't think we use time enough in our laboratory. It's a free parameter and it can be very valuable if something happens during acquisition where you actually can recover a sample where you're not gonna be able to go back and get another bone marrow, especially in a pediatric patient. 
first essentially ensure that the um, acquisition was stable throughout the length of time that you acquired uh, the events. You then gate out doublets, you gate out debris, you fine tune your gating on B cells, and that allows you to identify B cells that are expressing patterns that are different from normal and in, in the ways that Brent explained yesterday, too much, too little, aberrant, wrong phenotype, uh, wrong lineage, et cetera. Um, so in this case, we identified 152 red events in the P4 gate. Um, this analysis would again repeat it in tube two. The denominator of nucleated monoleukin cells determined in tube three. You then calculate the percent abnormal cells of the nucleated mononuclear cells, and this is your percent MRD and you report the average of the two tubes. This is the result of our approval process. Clearly within the 0.5 log, we were off and running. Now we have to contend with validation within our own lab, and you heard from Terry Oldacker what that portends. And so these, all of this has to be performed before we can essentially start testing patients in the COG-MRD protocol in my clinical laboratory. So here we are, we have now COG approval, internal validation um, versus our in-house MRD assay. And along comes the second part, and my gratefulness to Brent yesterday, immunotherapy. What do you do now when your assay that you've spent all this time and energy, not to mention dollars, <coughs> US dollars in this case, validating the test when the marker of interest is being targeted for treatment? So. We heard yesterday about CAR T cells, glutatumumab is bispecific for CD3. We also have uh, CD22. The developer of CD22, Alan Wayne from the National Cancer Institute, um, a year after I came, came to our institution and was very keen on getting CD22 uh, monoclonals as well as CAR T cell treatments up and running. And of course, rituximab has been around for a fair, fair amount of time. So with how do we identify BLLMRD in the era of anti-CD19 therapy? Um, as we know, COG-MRD uses CD19 uh, because of its stability, specificity, and ubiquity of expression during B-cell ontology. But CD19 can be lost following an immunotherapy. Therefore, we had to develop new gating strategies. And again, we, we are very grateful to Brent Wood in his lab, again, before he actually published the paper of a new novel eight-color CD19 negative panel that allows you to gate B-cells using slightly different and novel strategies. So we adopted these strategies. Unfortunately, we couldn't use exactly the same reagents as Brett because my cytometer isn't quite as fancy as Brent's. Um, but we were able to develop our own panel, use CD22 with a negative myeloid gate uh, or CD24. This is the panel that we adopted and we gate on CD22 and or CD24 to identify B cells and then look for the expression of markers that are coincident with abnormal B cell blasts. So basically, we're able to detect abnormal B cells using this strategy. And again, we have to validate this assay in our own laboratory. So that's all fine and dandy. When you start treating these patients, they will relapse. And so I think, I think Brett has pro said approximately 20% of the patients treated in CD19-directed therapies relapse. This has been our experience. To date, we have 40 patients on CAR T-cell therapies and about 10 who have not been um, able to get on a CAR T-cell trial who have been treated with glenotumumab, and we have 10 patients that have relapsed with a CD19 negative B-cell, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the reasons for failure of CAR T-cells is that they can simply disappear and the tumor will recur. Or you can lose the actual CD19 um, through a um, essentially mutation in the splice site so that the, the site targeted for CD19 is actually lost and you get a mutated protein that strips on the cell surface that will not be identified by the CD19 antibody. So we have seen this um, with uh, glenotumumab. We've um, identified CD19 BALL. Um, the other way that BALL can escape CAR T cell directed therapy is that there is a lineage switch. So the BALL will actually switch phenotype from a BALL to an AML. And there are several studies now um, reporting this, and we'll look at a couple of these. Um, I think it's very well established that patients with MLL rearrangements in their um, B 
ALL at diagnosis are very susceptible to relapse, um, to AML. Uh, the mechanism involved in the AML switch in uh, BCR ABO rearranged uh, blast is slightly different, we think, than the mechanisms involved in other um, genetic uh, abnormalities present in B cells at diagnosis. Um, the other uh, population are BCL ABO uh, rearrangements. And again, this is probably BCR ABO present in stem cells and differentiated B cells at diagnosis. When you eliminate the B cells, you give a selected advantage to the stem cells harboring the mutation. And these stem cells essentially will grow out with the phenotype of a myeloid uh, precursor. There have also been reports very recently of non-MLL uh, non rearranged, non-BCR able uh, leukemias switching um, to AML. And the case that I want to present is such a case uh, that we um, essentially discovered um, over the past three years and have just recently identified the abnormality in this um, patient, but this patient suffered a very protracted, very prolonged, serious course of relapse refractory BALL. The patient was originally diagnosed at 13 months of age, um, was treated uh, with standard treatment after induction, was MRD positive, but became MRD negative post-consolidation relapsed in May and had their, his first CAR T cell treatment in the first Novartis trial in July of 2015. By August, he was MRD negative. But we had a second relapse in November, um, had a second CAR T cell treatment, and then was subject to bone marrow transplant in January of 2016. Unfortunately, relapsed approximately six months later, had another CAR T cell treatment and a second bone marrow transplant and was MRD negative um, just last Christmas. Unfortunately, this patient suffered a relapse six months ago, and when we got the, the uh, bone marrow and did morphology on the marrow, it was very clear that these were no longer B cells. And so it was a B cell to AML switch. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what our laboratory does uh, in the context of flow cytometry and molecular testing in this case. So this is the second relapse. Um, this is when the patient came to our hospital um, essentially for the uh, second and third CAR T cell trials, which we had now um, been allowed to enroll patients in. Very clearly, this is BALL, -L, um, positive for 12Q deletion by cytogenetics and negative for MLL rearrangement by FISH, also negative for BCR ABO. Um, all new diagnostic, diagnosed tumors, solid tumors, as well as hematologic malignancies are now subject to what we term our pediatric cancer panel. This is a panel that we've developed over the last 10 years, um, really focusing on pediatric cancer. Um, it is both DNA and RNA based, so we are able to sequence and identify all fusion products by essentially ver reverse transcribing RNA and measuring uh, fusion products present in leukemias. So in this patient, the um, relapse was subject to our cancer panel, and we discovered, um, to our surprise, that the patient had a ZNF384 fusion product uh, with TCF3. This had been recently reported to identify a new subgroup of pediatric BALL that really responded poorly to treatment and had a phenotype that is relatively similar to what we see in the MLL rearranged BALL. Essentially weak CD10 expression and aberrant CD13 or 33. Um, and they, in their cohort of patients, um, they really were patients with a poor prognosis. They, uh, they, replied, they responded very poorly to steroids and had a higher frequency of relapse. Very reminiscent of our patient. However, it has not been reported that this genomic finding resulted or was an increased risk for BLL switch to AML. And so when we ran the fourth relapse, sequenced this patient, essentially we had to identify, is this the patient's relapse or is it a donor leukemia, okay? So we confirmed the mutation in the AML. We then went back, procured the diagnostic specimen and confirmed that the, uh, the fusion was present in the diagnostic specimen, essentially confirming that this was the patient's tumor that had progressed from BALL to AML. And we published this just a few weeks ago in the uh, Pediatric Blood and Cancer Journal. 
So just when we think we have it all down pat, we have this observation, and again, as reported by Brent yesterday, this is the phenotype in an MLL positive patients were on high alert looking for relapse. Sure enough, this is simply the presence of normal early B cell precursors that are now, we are now seeing these because of the stress induced on CD19 and giving a selective advantage to these early precursors. Um, so in summary, um, MRD is, I believe that MRD is still the most powerful prognostic tool for predicting outcome in children, adolescents, and young adults with B acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Standardization of monoclonal antibody panels and standardization of the analysis strategies improves precision of flow cytometry-based MRD testing. MR, uh, immunotherapy is going to continue to require that laboratories are always continuously adapting new gating and analogous strategies, which means more validation. And new biologics are leading to new observations in B-cell ontogeny and are helping in the understanding of the complex mechanisms of the leukemogenesis. And with that, I will thank you for your attention.